Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Youth Authors and ARCs. I am Ronnie Curry, Associate Editor, Books for Youth at Booklist, and my pronouns are he and him. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slides and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. If you're in the audience, you are in listen-only mode, but we definitely welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question, if you need technical assistance, simply, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists. If we don't have time um, to address the question during the webinar, um, they'll get the chance to follow up with you after the webinar. Finally, Booklist is now offering closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar that I just mentioned. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Today, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Britta Lundeen, author of Like Other Girls from Disney Publishing Worldwide, Taylor K. Mejia, author of Paula Santiago and the Forest of Nightmares from Disney Publishing Worldwide, Catherine Otoshi, author of Lunch Every Day from KO Kids, Alda P. Dobbs, author of Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna from Sourcebooks, and Serafina Nance, author of Little Leonardo's Fascinating World of Astronomy from Gibbs Smith. So each author is going to give a brief introduction to their book. And after that, we will move to a Q&A portion. Um, and so if you're in the audience, definitely um, send your questions in through the Q&A. Um, and we'll try to include those in the Q&A when the time comes. First up, we are going to hear from Britta Lundeen. Britta grew up in a small town in Oregon, playing basketball, softball, and for two formative years, flag football. She works as a TV writer on such shows as Riverdale and Betty. She is the author of the novel Ship It. She lives in Los Angeles with her wife and family. And I'm really sorry to say, unfortunately, due to a, a personal emergency, Britta wasn't able to join us live today, but she was able to send over a pre-recorded introduction to her book. So we are going to play that for you. Um, and without further ado, here is Britta. Hi, everyone. My name is Britta Lundeen, and I am the author of the book Like Other Girls, which comes out on August 3rd. Like Other Girls is set in rural Oregon. It's about Mara, who is a teenage lesbian who really only hangs out with other guys, her best friend Quinn and her brother Noah. Mara has anger issues. And when she's kicked off the basketball team for fighting, there's only one chance that she can get back on the following year. And that's if she proves to her coach she can play another sport, a team sport, without violence. And since her two best friends are on the football team, she decides she's going to play football. And at first it goes great. Mara is a very physical person, and she's six foot two, and she is good at football. She likes being tackled and she loves tackling people. It goes great. But then the worst thing that could happen happens, which is that four more girls join the football team, including her crush, Valentina, and her arch enemy, Carly, who is very loud and outspoken, all of the things that Mara is not. These girls look to Mara as an inspiration. They see Mara as a role model. They see this as a movement. Mara just wants to play football. She's not there for any of those reasons. She's not like those other girls. Or is she? This is a book about confronting your own internalized misogyny, something Mara's gonna have to learn how to do. She's gotta get past that. 
it's also a book about gender presentation. Mara starts to understand her own presentation as being a little bit more on the butch side. There's a hair cutting scene in the book that I really love. Um, it's also about rural culture. Mara uh, lives in rural Oregon. I also grew up in a small town in rural Oregon. And I find that the issues that affect queer people in small towns are very different than the issues that affect pe queer people in cities. I currently live in Los Angeles, and my life here could not be more different than it was when I lived in a small town. I wanted to honor the experiences of being a teenage lesbian in a small town. This is a football book, and so if you like football, there's a lot to love in this book. I love the scenes of girls getting dirty and getting messy and being tough and gritty and not being afraid to get down, get in the mud, get the grass stains, get a bloody nose, have sore muscles. I love all that stuff. If you're not a sports person though, it's fine. This is really more a book about female friendships and gender politics. And there's a very sweet queer romance in it as well. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there today. Um, I have My day job took me away at the last second. I'm a TV writer by day. Um, I've worked on such shows as Riverdale and the HBO girls skateboarding show, Betty, and I'm currently on a new Fox show called The Big Leap that'll be coming out in the fall about real people who learn to be dancers. Um, I love being a TV writer, but honestly my passion is and, and always will be writing books. I, one of my favorite parts of the experiences is getting to meet readers and librarians and booksellers and I hope that one day we can get back to doing that in person very soon. Anyway, thank you all for coming out today and I hope you guys enjoy Like Other Girls. Thanks to Britta for that. And although she isn't here today, um, I do encourage you in the audience, um, if you have questions for her, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, and there's a chance that she or her team might be able to answer them um, later on and get back to you on that. Our next presenter will be Taylor K. Mejia. Taylor is an Oregon native in love with the Alpine meadows and evergreen forests of her home state where she lives with her daughter. When she's not writing, you can find her plucking at her guitar, stealing rosemary sprigs from overgrown gardens, or trying to make the perfect vegan tamale. She is the author of Paolo Santiago and the River of Tears and the YA fantasy novels, We Set the Dark on Fire and We Unleash the Merciless Storm. Take it away, Taylor. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to say thank you so much for being here to talk about books with us. It's my very favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, yeah, as you said, my name is Taylor K. Mejia. I'm the author of the Paolo Santiago series, which features a science-obsessed Mexican-American seventh grader who's very skeptical of her mom's belief in cultural folktales. But Pao, like so many of us at that age, has to learn she doesn't quite know it all, especially when her best friend Emma goes missing and all the clues Pao can find point to a supernatural culprit. In the first book in the series, Paula Santiago and the River of Tears, it's out now with its sequel, Paula Santiago and the Forest of Nightmares, coming August 3rd of this year, and the final installment will be next summer. Today, I just want to tell you a little bit about my journey to writing these books, and then I'm going to share an excerpt with you guys from the first book. As a kid, I was a voracious reader of all things fantasy. These other worlds were a powerful escape from the struggles of my early life, and I dove in again and again, feeling myself change with each new adventure I went on. What I didn't realize until much later was that some of those changes weren't for the better. Each time I entered a new world, determined to find myself in a hero or heroine and their adventure, I was forced to leave something of myself behind. My mixed family with all its strange cultural intersections, the budding queerness I was aware of even then, most of all the burden of adult responsibility within my family, which had found me too early. Those parts of me were never shown on the pages of these books or in their characters' families who looked one way, spoke one language, had well-manicured suburban lawns and after-school snacks and never worried about their parents' finances. Instead of finding fault with the books, I found it was my own life and all the ways it failed to measure up. I began to believe I was not the kind of kid who would ever end up a hero, and I wasn't alone in that. 
In many ways, Pao's stories are built of all these doubts, all the parts of me I tried to shed because they didn't fit. She's not a girl who adheres to the default, and she has her own struggles with that throughout her adventures as she encounters old superstitions, racism and xenophobia in her small southwestern town, and her own belief, taken from narratives like the ones that shaped me, that her modern sensibilities, interest in science and adventure are fundamentally incompatible with her family's culture. I believe that we do young readers like I once was a disservice by teaching them that all heroes are alike. That to be born Anglo, white, straight, and affluent makes you automatically worthy of a story and a sidekick and an arc that helps you find your power and save the world. While stories about other types of kids are better used as cautionary tales, tales of a distant past or an exotic faraway land, we're here, vibrant, living, and our struggles do not make us any less worthy of the epic adventure, the adoring crowd, the treasure in the final cave, or the chance to grow up strong, valued, and heard. I'm really proud to offer the Paula Santiago series as one small window or mirror. I'm proud to join the many other marginalized authors that never found themselves in their childhood books and grew up to write that wrong with their own stories. I'm proud to do my part to show today's readers that they don't need to cut themselves down to be seen as the hero of their story, their community, or their world. And now I'm going to read an excerpt from the first book in my series, Paulo Santiago and the River of Tears. When Pao opened the door to apartment C, the smell of incense was overwhelming. That meant her mom was reading tarot. Pao's natural steeliness started to buckle. Her mother only consulted the cards when things weren't going well. Mom, I'm home, Pao called, dropping her backpack on the living room floor. There had to be 15 candles burning on the shelf above the serape covered couch. Green candles, Pao noted. She only burned those when they needed money. Well, more than usual anyway. In here, mijita, her mom called from the dining room slash kitchen, which only took about five steps to reach in their tiny apartment. Pao pasted on a smile as she crossed the threshold, hoping not to notice any other signs of bad news. Her mom sat cross-legged in the paisley upholstered dining chair, her dark hair in a messy bun held with a single chopstick. Her eyes were narrowed at a tarot spread on the weathered kitchen table, incense smoke swirling around her. You know, Pao said, if we had a dog, he could bark for help when you pass out from all this incense and one of the candles sets the house on fire. The smoke alarm had stopped working a year ago, but the manager of the Riverside Palace Apartments hadn't responded to multiple requests from Pao, of course, to replace it. Pao's mom smiled back from the tiny table, but her eyes were tired. My old soul baby, she said, reaching out to squeeze Pao's hand. You've always been the adult around here. A sadness settled in Pao's chest. Mom had said it lightly, like a joke, but Pao didn't think it was funny. Do those cards say anything about what's for dinner? Pao asked, trying to hold on to her smile, even though the incense smoke was giving her a headache. Oh no, her mom said, is it that time already? She pushed aside her two long bangs and looked in disbelief out the glass door to the patio. Twilight was settling over the crowded terracotta pots where Pao's mom grew herbs and flowers. Pao tried to squash a feeling of irritation. Had her mom really been so wrapped up in the cards that she didn't notice the time? It wasn't like the whole sky changing colors thing was easy to miss in Arizona. But of course, her mom didn't allow clocks anywhere she did divination work. She always said, along with cell phones and microwaves, that clocks messed with the vibe. Apparently, the ancestors couldn't get to her through all that noise. Too bad the ancestors can't also protect us from the rent going up, Pao thought. Her mom tried to hide that kind of stuff from her, but Pao trained her observational powers constantly. She didn't miss the notices with the red rectangles around the past due amounts. You know, I'm actually not that hungry anymore, Pao said, even though she was. Right then, the urge to be alone with her thoughts was stronger than the urge to eat. Pao waited for her mom's rebuttal, but none came. Her eyes were glued to the floor, where she'd accidentally knocked two cards under the table. On another day, Pao might have jokingly asked if the tower and the fool meant they could get a dog. But today, for a reason she didn't fully understand, she just left the room without saying goodnight. Pao sat on her bed alone, Surrounded by pictures of SpaceX and Blue Origin rocket launches she printed out at the library, the colored ink streaky and dull, taped to the wall above her desk, which was her grandma's old sewing table, so it didn't even have drawers, was last year's science project on algae farming. She'd won first place without even mentioning the organism's potential to power rockets. Meanwhile, her mom burned candles in search of money to pay bills and thought the right card layout could keep ghosts and monsters away. Maybe, Pao thought, if she had enough algae, she could blast herself right out of this place. Thank you guys so much. 
Thank you so much, Taylor. That was great. Next up, we are going to hear from Catherine Otoshi. Catherine is a multi-award winning author, illustrator, and speaker, best known for her character building number color book series zero, one, and two. She goes across the country to encourage kids to develop strong character assets and help teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, find creative methods to connect with their students through the power of reading, art, and literature. Thank you so much for being here, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be with you. And uh, Booklist informed me that it sounds like um, you know we'll be hopefully seeing each other virtually, all of us, um, at conferences, which I love, <laughs> so I could see everyone face to face. Um, the book I'm going to share with you today is called Lunch Every Day. And sort of the background um, behind the inspiration of this book is um, my friend Jim, who's an educator, and he does all these amazing anti-bullying programs, for example, and community building projects. Um, I met him at a conference, and he said, "You should come to my school because you know I'd been doing like um, you know a whole presentation about one and zero, for example, and talking about anti-bullying, which is what those number color books are about, um, and other character building assets." And so I did, and then um, he's like, that went great, come back again. And I kept coming back to his school. So we became friends over time and over lunch, of course, um, we were talking and I said, you are so amazing, Jim. I don't know how you do it all and so forth. And he kind of looked at me with this, um, not guilty expression exactly, but he, it was like a, a moment. And he said, you know, um, I just need to tell you something when I was growing up. I was a bully. And when he said that, I nearly dropped my fork. Um, I was like, you're kidding. I'm like, well, what turned you around? And he told me this story. And this is what lunch every day is about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And Ronnie, Grace, please let me know if it's all working OK, as you can tell <laughs> things are always different each time we share our screen, but um, I'm going to go ahead and do the full screen mode. And if there's any looks issues, good. it looks good. Okay, yep. good. Just keep on going. So <laughs> here's my story lunch every day. All right. And I, what's kind of cool is um, we used um, craft paper for the end pages. Um, so here we go. There he is. Just look at him, skinny neck, slumping. Is there a face behind all that hair? I can topple him with a tap. Hey, no way am I standing in that line. Hmm, at least his lunch is good. Better than mine. Bet his home is better than mine too. Older brothers, you know. Next day at school, I shove him extra hard just because I can. Someone sees me do it, tattletale. I end up in the office. The principal tells me to try, blah, 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 my potential, blah, blah, blah. I look down like I feel bad. Mostly, I just feel mad. Things stay the same for a while until, hey, did you get one? Yeah, the whole class did. Are you going? Sure, why not? Huh, skinny kids having a party. Everyone's invited, even me. What are you gonna wear? Maybe my new dress, I love parties. Whatever, I'm so not going. The morning of, I look out my window. I let the sun warm me up for a while. I put on my best shirt and go. When I get there, everyone is holding a gift. I put my hands in my pockets. I walk down the pathway, up the stairs to the front door. I see skinny kid's mom inside holding his birthday cake. Everyone is celebrating in the kitchen. I stay in the living room, huh? And he looks down and he's looking at the photos and he sees that skinny kid has had some losses in his own life 
as well. I slump down in a chair, kicking air. I hear a sound and look up. His mom is in the doorway like she knows I'm there. She sees me like sees me. She marches right up to me. She says in a real quiet voice, Jimmy, what would you like for lunch tomorrow? Nothing, don't need anything. I hear you like my lunches. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to make a second lunch and my son will bring it for you every day, okay? And you know something? She did. And that's how I got lunch every day and a whole lot more. Um, so just the author's note about Jim, he's an educator in Southern California. Um, and under his leadership, um, he has literally helped hundreds of thousands of kids through his anti-bullying programs and gang intervention. And as I said, community building projects that he does. Um, so of course the book is dedicated to Jim, but also to the lady um, who made all those lunches for him day after day. And also to the kid who must have seen beyond Jim's tough exterior um, to let his mom know and open up and just say, you know what, maybe um, a reach out is something that I can do. But um, yeah, literally um, I'm so touched by this person and I'm just super happy to share with a book you this book that's coming out um, this fall. Um, it looks like it's gonna be October now. <laughs> so thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Catherine, that looks great. Sometimes technology works. <laughs> and next up, we are gonna hear from Alda P. Dobbs. Alda is as passionate about connecting children to their past, their communities and nature as she is about writing. She lives with her husband and two children outside Houston, Texas. Take it away, Alda. All right. Well, thank you so much. My goodness, I, I almost cried with Catherine's uh, Lunch Every Day book. I had to uh, tell myself, okay, quit it, quit it. You know, <laughs> just so I could be ready for this presentation here. But man, that's good. So I'm going to share uh, my screen here as well and see if I could work this out. Just a second. Um... And if you could let me know if um it's, yep, it's coming up. Okay, all right. So I'll extend this here. There you go. Okay, perfect. So my presentation, my book is uh, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. And it's based on my stories that my great grandmother and grandmother told. So these are their pictures. My great grandmother's here at the center. And this is my grandmother and all the stories and anecdotes they told were passed down to my mom who passed them down to me. And that's us right here when I was little. And their stories were always about the struggles they had as children, all the, the harsh poverty they endured, the hunger, the grueling work they did since the age of three. And all those stories, you know, just taught me about them, about their, uh, the adversities they faced and also about the courage. And it was incredible just to see how much courage they had and, and they needed that in order to survive the day to day uh, lack of food and uncertainty. And uh, at that time in Mexico in the 1900s and the early 1900s, because the story is based in 1913, uh, Mexico, only 1% of the population in Mexico owned land. So if you could imagine that 99% did not own land. And also another statistic is that only 20% of the population of Mexico was uh, literate. So that left a vast majority of the country that couldn't read and write. And my great grandmother was one of them. And her dream was to learn how to read and, and write. But these disparities are ultimately what led to the, to the Mexican revolution in the 1910s. And the story in Barefoot Dreams of Petroluna follows my great grandmother's where she had to escape her village because of the violence that was happening there. The, the established Mexican army was uh, 
forcing men to join. They're conscripting the men and even boys as young as six and seven years old. So my great grandmother talked talked about uh, leaving her hometown, her village, which was in central northern Mexico here by the mountains in Coahuila. And they walked for days through the desert in order to reach the, the border town of uh, Piedras Negras, which is the border city to uh, Eagle Pass, Texas. And uh, the stories just were incredible. She talked about arriving with her family to a bridge, trying to cross into America to get to the safety of America. But the bridge was, was shut, the border was shut. And she said they waited there for days and they knew the Federales, that army, the Mexican army was coming after them. And she said, not until they arrived at the town and brought out their cannons and pointed at the crowd, that's when uh, chaos ensued and everybody just dashed to the bridge and started begging the, the military, the US military GIs to open the gate. And she remembers their faces and them running back and forth, scrambling, not knowing what to do. And uh, she said she doesn't know why, but at one point the gates were open and everybody just ran through for, for refuge there in the United States. So I decided to write the story. And uh, at one point, let me see, and I did the research when I, I wanted to find out first if the story was true or not. So I read every book on the Mexican Revolution in Spanish and English and found nothing about my great grandmother's incident. Even though I had some of the information, the only thing I liked was the date, but I knew the basic story where she was at. So one librarian led me to the portal to Texas history. And I saw this as a time machine because I was able to read every newspaper that had been printed during that time. And about six, seven months of reading every newspaper from day to day, from starting from the, the moment that the revolution officially started in 1910, I finally came across this article. So that was the official revolution start, but this is the article I found that talked, it said, fearful scenes enacted in flight of refugees from Piedras Negras. And that's when I knew that my great grandmother's story was true. And uh, everything was described as she had uh, told. The only thing was that she said it was hundreds of people that had crossed that bridge and it was actually thousands. It was nearly 7,000 people who had run across. And once I had the date, which was October 5th, I found this picture later on, which it was just mesmerizing because uh, it shows the, the bridge back here. That's the International Bridge and that's Piedras Negras in Mexico. And so this is a crowd that's running that day. And somewhere in that crowd is my great grandmother. So that, that just moved me a lot when I saw that, that photograph. And the story continues from Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. There's book two that follows up, that follows her story in the refugee camps that were set along the border. And my great grandmother was in one of those camps. And the story also follows Petra Luna as she moves to San Antonio along with 30,000 refugees, which changed the, the landscape of San Antonio forever. And uh, these are pictures of the of San Antonio and how, like I said, it, it's it was a different city with 30,000 refugees arriving within a couple of years. And something I want readers to realize is just in that I learned myself from the research is just the echoes of history. When I side by side, I have these pictures from the past and from the present. It just it's the same thing. It just gives you goosebumps when you see people escaping violence and it's happening now, 100 years later. And you have the crisis at the border and at this same exact border that my great grandmother crossed, you have that now in that same city. And those uh, uh, refugee camps that my great grandmother was in, you have them now. And back then they had the smallpox scare and you have of course COVID-19 now. And the disparities that my great grandmother talked about, uh, like you see here, these four ladies dressed in silk and these two girls walking opposite with ragged clothes and barefoot, which is how my grandmother and uh, great grandmother would have been dressed. You see those vast disparities and you see that now here in America and all over the world. And something I want children and readers to learn too is just that we also have that same spirit of giving that was done in the past. We have that now in the present. And if you go to my website, I have resources that explains more on the research of the novel. And there's uh, resources there, uh, discussion guides and educators guides. And I also have a playlist that shows all the music 
the corridos that were made during that era, during the revolution. And I also have a newsletter that uh, explains more about the revolution and gives uh, behind the scenes of the book and the research behind the book. So thank you so much uh, for having me here. Thank you, Booklist. And uh, at the moment, they're doing a Goodreads giveaway of my book. So uh, if you want to spread the word, thank you so much. And I appreciate you, you listening today. So I'm going to stop sharing screen here. And, and thank you. Thank you, Alda. That was really great. And our final author presentation before the Q&A will come from Serafina Nance. Serafina is an astrophysicist, advocate, writer, speaker, and science communicator whose work has been featured in the BBC, National Geographic, SF Chronicle, Refinery29, and elsewhere. She has published three academic papers in both the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and the Astrophysical Journal. She has also discussed astronomy on NPR's shortwave, has just been selected as one of Arab America's 40 under 40, and one of Forbes' 30 interesting women. And she hosts an, an astronomy show called Constellations to an audience of nearly 5 million. She lives in Berkeley, California with her partner and her dog, Comet. Thank you so much for joining us, Serafina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, let's see, I think, Grace, are you um, sharing the slides? Awesome, thank you. So thanks for that introduction. Um, I am Serafina Nance, and I am so excited to talk about my upcoming children's book about astronomy, which is a deep love of my life called Little Leonardo's Fascinating World of Astronomy. Let me go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. Um, I have loved astronomy and the night sky since I was a little kid, and I used to stargaze with my dad every night and listen to Stardate Radio um, on NPR with my mom as a little kid, which maybe she thought was a little weird. Um, but I was obsessed with the night sky, and I wanted you know, to do anything in my power to do astronomy, become an astronaut, whatever it was that could get me closer to the, to the universe. So on the left is a picture of me. Um, I think I'm age four. Uh, in a spacesuit. And then on the right is a picture of me taken, uh, let's see, about two weeks ago when I was selected for an analog astronaut mission, which is basically a simulation of living on Mars as an astronaut. Um, so I'll be doing that later this summer. And so, you know, I do a lot of different things with astronomy. I'm an astrophysicist. I study supernova, which are exploding stars. I study cosmology, which is sort of the nature, the origin of our universe. And then I am really passionate about communicating these ideas to other people. And that takes a lot of different forms. I'm a science communicator. I write about science. Um, so my goal is to just share as much as I can about the universe and what I'm passionate about with other people. And the reason that I want to give a little bit of this background is because for most of my life, I didn't feel like I had a place in astronomy or in science. I didn't have women to look up to in science um, that I knew about as a little kid. And I especially didn't have women of color to look up to. Um, I just didn't know about them. And so for me, you know, as a, as a, you know, sort of professional astronomer now, it's really important to be able to share my story with others and to share sort of this passion with others and to increase representation. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So a little bit of statistics, um, just some, some facts. Women make up 28% of the current science and engineering workforce. Women of color make up 5% of the current science and engineering workforce. And this is just a small piece of the problem, as you can imagine. All of this becomes infinitely more difficult when you include other intersections of marginalization. And there are a lot of studies that talk about and show how this social conditioning and stereotyping, in addition to explicit and implicit threats, can affect those with marginalized identities and cause you know, young kids to not continue to pursue their dreams. So I'm happy to talk about some of those studies. One of the most important ones to me is that when children as young as eight 
are asked to draw a mathematician or a scientist, girls are actually two times more likely to draw a man than a woman. And so I think it's really important to understand all sort of intersections of why that happens. And first and foremost, I think it's important to think of science and engineering and math as a culture that affects people, including those at the margins. And so when we fail to take an inclusive intersectional approach, we leave people behind. We can go to the next slide. So when we do science and when we communicate science, we need to think about who is doing that and who that science serves. So on this slide, I show a picture taken from science publication, um, Big Science Journal in 2014 that shows the top 50 scientists on Twitter. And as you can tell, most of them are white and male. And I thought, okay, well, that's 2014. Let's go to 2020. Is it any better? So on the right, those top 50 most influential scientists in the world today, four out of the 50 are women and zero out of 50 are women of color. And then I thought, all right, well, maybe we're not getting our science, you know, in journals or whatever. Let's look at YouTube. But, you know, a lot of young people watch YouTube. Eight out of 10 of the top YouTube science channels are men. And the other two of those 10 are science cartoons that are narrated by men. And so it's really interesting and important to think about who is communicating the science and how that affects the young people who are getting all of this information and trying to see themselves in these roles. We can go to the next slide. So my goal, one of my many goals, um, especially in this, in this book, in Little Leonardo's Fascinating World of Astronomy, is to share some fascinating facts about the universe, some of the coolest things that I think um, I want everybody to know about our universe. But I also wanted to create a book where every single child can look at these pages, or adult, every, everyone can look at these pages and see themselves can see themselves in space, see themselves learning about science and physics and math and all of these fascinating topics that sometimes kids don't see themselves um, as able to or belonging in those spaces. We can go to the next slide. So I just wanna give a shout out to our um, illustrator. He did such an incredible job, uh, Greg Paprocki. And as you can see, these illustrations are just beautiful. They transport you to all of these incredible places in the universe that I hope to one day be able to go see as an astronaut. Um, and, you know, it humanizes some of these places. It, for me, it gets people excited, it gets people interested, and it gets people to see potentially themselves, hopefully, flying through space one day. You can go to the next slide. So just to recap, you know, my goal is to share cool science with an emphasis on representation. So I do that in a lot of different ways. I host an astronomy show, Constellations. I give talks. I write long Twitter threads about space. I share cool tidbits on, on Instagram. And I'm also writing a memoir right now called Starstruck that will be out in the next couple of years. So I'm really, really passionate about sharing the most interesting, wonderful facts about our universe and showing that anybody can be a scientist. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Serafina, and thank you everybody for your wonderful presentations. So we are going to shift gears to Q&A mode and so we can all turn our cameras on. Again, if you're in the audience, um, the Q&A box is open. Um, I'm seeing a lot of positive feedback, not a lot of questions yet, but there's still time. Um, so I will kick things off and I wanted to start, and maybe I should wait for Alda for just a moment, make sure her camera is working. Hello. All right. So um, I want to ask each of you sort of a version of the question of how you arrived at your current project um, or what you've brought to this project from, from some of your past work. Um, and Serafina, you, you sort of just, just nailed that question. So I'm going to come back to you um, and I'm going to start with Alda. So Alda, you've worked in a number of different fields. I, I think you've studied uh, physics um, and, and worked in engineering. And I, I think I read that you've been a mime uh, at some point in your life. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. 
Um, but what made you kind of shift towards um, a career in storytelling and why, why was this the book that, that took you there and, and why did you want to write it for children? It's a great question. I, I even I asked myself that how I so like to end up here writing for for children. I I've always wanted to write. I always had stories actually in my head. I was a reluctant reader because I didn't learn English until I was well into the fourth fifth grade. So it was always a love hate relationship with English. And but I love stories. I love listening to family stories and uh, telling them as well and passing them on. So every time I came across a, a family and they were telling stories, I sat down and tried to just absorb those. And also at work with coworkers, there were so many different uh, people that I came across. And even when I worked as a mime too, <laughs> that was a, an interesting one. <laughs> and, and, uh, and even the physics background too, I, I'm sure Serafina could agree with me that when you study physics, you got to have that imagination to imagine all this theoretical world. That's the only way I, I figure you could uh, accomplish that, uh, things in physics, because the problems are so phenomenal. But all that <clears throat> being said, in college, I thought I wanted to be a writer, and uh, I signed up for placements tests and did well in the math. But when I did the English, I, I failed. I bombed it really bad and was placed in remedial English. So at that point, I said, you know what? That's a sign. Somebody's telling me writing's not for you. Don't, you know, it's, it, you like storytelling. Keep it in the back of your mind. Maybe one day if a miracle happens, but it's not meant to happen now. So I pursued the degrees in physics and engineering. But the thought of writing was still in my head. And not until later on, uh, I always gave talks to children on science and physics and relativity and enjoyed expressing that and trying to get them to see that world. And uh, when I started writing stories and articles for children, that's when it, the passion finally came to me. I said, you know what, I could do this. And I, I think it was with age that the confidence came through that I figured through proposals and presentations. I've always been a writer. I've always been a communicator. So I did the leap, so. That's great, that's inspiring. I'm glad you, you, you were able to push through those barriers. Catherine, I'm gonna move on to you. Um, similar question um, as far as bringing your background to your work. So you've been making beautiful picture books for, for a number of years now, um, but before that you spent some time in the film industry. Um, specifically, I think you've worked at Industrial Light and Magic, which is, which is pretty exciting to me. So how has your background in film influenced the way you create picture books? Um. Yeah, so what's kind of interesting is being both author and illustrator and kind of graphic designer, um, I'm seeing everything uh, in, in kind of a cohesive way that I, it, it's sort of fun to just play off of each other, but film has really informed um, my storytelling ability simply because I see, you know, all the books kind of behind me as mini movies. And so when I am working on what my character might be, whether it be a robot or a little girl or simply a blob of color, um, I'm casting that character as my main character. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I have scenes like uh, what the, you know, the set is going to be on the background. So for one, it, I decide to not have anything and just leave it um, pretty much a white page. But for some of my other stories, it all becomes choices of, you know, how I sort of decorate the scene. And, um, and I also realized when you turn the page, that's like um, being an editor, that's like a cut in a scene. So, so much of about it is um, with film that I learned is about doing close-ups like for lunch every day where you see Jimmy's face up close and you see his eyes versus pulling away so that you see kind of the whole, um, give, giving a context of where he's at. Um, that all sort of informed um, my, my storytelling ability as, a, as an illustrator. Excellent, thank you. Taylor, um, I wanted to ask you, so you, you sort of um, kicked off your career writing YA. Um, so I, can you talk about sort of making that move into middle grade more, more kind of from a craft standpoint and how your approach to writing middle grade um, was different from young adult? Yeah, actually, my very first like failed <laughs> novel that did not get me an agent was a middle grade. So okay. <laughs> I kind of always wanted to write middle grade first. Um, it was just like really bad. <laughs> I go back and look at it sometimes and I'm like, wow, OK, nice to see where you've grown from there. But um, <laughs> yeah, my favorite thing about middle grade is that 
YA is sort of like you're on the precipice of adulthood. So everything you're learning through your adventures in a YA novel is going to serve you as you kind of break away from your shell and your family and kind of your childhood life and go out to kind of make your own mark. But an adventure in middle grade is so different because they they still learn and they grow and they're trying to like become independent, but they're still so far from that moment of like breaking away and becoming their adult selves. So there's kind of like a second wave of it where they come into the adventure, they learn so much about themselves and then they have to go back into their childhood world and figure out how to incorporate all the things that they've learned into maybe like a previous version of themselves that they don't identify with anymore. And I love that conflict of like, how do I still identify with family, younger siblings, going to school, all these things that kind of feel confining to them after they come home from their big adventure. So how can you change your life based on what you've learned when you're not ready to leave your life yet? So that's my favorite part of writing middle grade. And definitely the biggest difference, I think, with YA, it's kind of a straighter trajectory of like up and out. And with middle grade, it's a little bit more of a cycle. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Thank you. Um, let me go back to Serafina now. Um, I kind of want to ask each of you a little bit about research. Um, so Serafina, I, I, I imagine you already had a pretty strong grasp of the material when you when you started writing this book. Um, but th there also must have been an element of research to how you kind of redirect those concepts to young kids. And this is a, a pretty young audience that you're, it seems you're shooting for. So um, yeah, how did you kind of strategize to, to translate that material to a picture book audience? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, first of all, I really wanted to capture all of the things that I think are the coolest aspects of our universe and communicate them the same way that I think about them, which isn't in a technical way. I think very, I think in pictures, I think in abstract concepts and exciting you know, black holes and exploding stars and things that really are eye catching. And so I was very lucky to have an illustrator who is fantastic at depicting some of these more exotic, extravagant aspects of our universe. And that really, I think, allows people to access the text in a completely different way and allows people to really be able to picture and sort of start to understand what some of these more difficult concepts can actually be like. And that means that anyone, I hope anyone from age, you know, four to 60 can get something from this book because there is so many different types of science and, and pictures that make it really accessible for everyone. Yeah, right on. I, I have a three-year-old, I have to say, and uh, I don't have a hard copy of your book uh, yet, but last night we were reading an astrophysics board book Yes, it's amazing that you know they'll pick up on whatever they pick up on, but they're yes. they're starting to absorb the different images and ideas and, and language. Absolutely, and so there's definitely a lot of power there. Um, thank you, um, Alda. Hello again. Um, so you've you've talked about how this book um, was based on your grandmother's experiences in, in the revolution, um, and you've you've already talked a good bit about the research you did. Um, but while you were researching, did you kind of come upon anything surprising about yourself or your own history that, that you didn't expect or that kind of changed your perspective on things? I think, um, excuse me, I think uh, just it's different from hearing the, the stories from your ancestors and then seeing the pictures, uh, just visually connecting all the stories and it just, it was a lot more of an impact. And that's why the title Barefoot Dreams came to me, just because all the kids I saw were barefoot, uh, despite the weather, or they, or they were in the desert or anywhere, they were barefoot because shoes are a luxury. And even now they're a luxury, we take them for granted, but you know, there's some places in the world that people still don't wear uh, shoes. So just the photographs, I, I was really moved and uh, by setting the faces too, just so much emotion in those pictures captured. There is one too about, uh, an orphanage that had just been raided and they were taking the kids to join the, the established federal army. And you just see their faces. These are children, eight years old, and just knowing where they were going, you know, that the, they were going to have to wear those uniforms. So I think I grew closer to that history and in turn grew closer to my ancestors, which is amazing because, I mean, they had passed already, but I feel closer to them than ever before after the, the, the book was complete. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really powerful. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. Um, let's go to Taylor. Um, again, on the sort of research um, direction, how did you go about researching kind of Latinx folklore um, and, and selecting which myths and monsters to use? Um, and maybe you can tease a couple from, from Forest of Nightmares for us. <laughs> yeah, um, I think like initially, because the first book centers the myth of La Llorona, the wailing woman who, I mean, it's it's definitely, I followed just like the, the guttural terror of my childhood, <laughs> like the thing that scared me the most, that's the one I wanted to do. Like, I wouldn't swim in a pool until I was like 10 because I was afraid of all water. Um, <laughs> because it's a terrifying story about like a woman who, <clears throat> for different reasons, depending on which version of the myth you read, drowns her children and then out of guilt drowns herself and then haunts the riverbank, like looking for more children to drown. <laughs> so it's, and I heard that story for the first time at like about four. So I think most of the research I did for the book was actually about the more, the science-y aspects of it because Pow as a character is really science-minded and I was not as a kid. So most of the, most of like the monsters and the folklore w- were all really there already. <laughs> I just had to pick the ones that made the biggest impact on me as a kid. Um, and then later on, after I had sort of cycled through all of the things that truly terrified me as a child, I did dig a little deeper and found out that just like the oral storytelling in my family, it's so it's like a big game of multinational telephone, like our versions of the myths are so different than some of the ones that I read. So it was just kind of a matter of like, sometimes I would find a piece that hadn't been there and the stories I was told as a kid that was actually even scarier so I would kind of meld them together and stuff but yeah for the most part I was just drawing on stories I already knew. <clears throat> gotcha. I love that both you and Alda have, have sort of referenced oral tradition as as kind of a route to, to your storytelling. I think that's really cool. Yeah we don't shy away from scaring our kids early do we Alda? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you faced your fears through this project as well. Um, Catherine. So you tend to tackle challenging subject matter as, as we've started to see bullying, self-esteem, conf- conflict resolution, things like that. Um, so as far as research, I, I have to imagine there's a lot to understand about kind of child development and psychology and that sort of thing. So um, I kind of want to know like what inspires you to pick a subject and then what do you do as far as research to kind of understand it before you begin tackling it? Yes, absolutely. Um, So much about how I'm inspired to do a book has to do with um, my own life experience, for example. Um, For example, the book one that dealt with the colors and numbers and using that as a whole play and a double meaning to stand up for yourself where the colors become numbers and count. Um, That actually had to do with a my own experience just growing up um, as a Japanese American kid and having um, um, no others at the time in my class or to my memory um, in the whole grade level, um, anybody who really looked like me. And and um, um, what happened was, for example, a, a, a new kid um, came in um, who was not um, born in California or even from this country and she was severely picked on and um, I, one day I even witnessed her getting bullied in um, the girl's bathroom. And I'm so ashamed to say that I did not stand up. And I, it, um, it really bothered me and I, I didn't know why. And I realized it came from a, a fear I had um, about um, who I was um, just being Asian American, um, how I saw myself, how, I was sort of brought up to not make waves. And also because I, 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 you know, I kind of suffered from, I think a low self-esteem where um, symbolically, which is what zero was about, for example, um, I kind of had a hole inside myself and because I wanted to look like everybody else, I tried to get the same brand of clothing, same, same kinds of material things, but didn't, wasn't working on my character, um, how to be brave, how to be courageous, um, how to learn how to, have a voice and speak up when you see injustice done. And um, so, yeah, it led to me talking about Zero, who, um, 
you know, um, felt devalued and didn't know how to fill that hole up. And two, for example, which deals with friendship and conflict resolution, but everything kind of is a journey um, from one experience um, to the next. So. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. I know everyone, everyone is, is, is being moved and, and a lot of a lot of strong feedback coming from your both your, your book and your words. Um, let me shift back to Serafina. Um, so Serafina, our, our core audience is librarians and educators and that sort of thing. So do you, I wonder if you have any sort of practical tips for fun ways of getting kids interested in STEM um, and also maybe incorporating ways to make STEM more inclusive in that, in that same process. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I mentioned in the presentation that I'll keep going back to is representation is incredibly important. So I think that when, you know, people see themselves or see someone who looks like them or seems like them, they're more likely to feel like they belong and stay engaged. Um, so I, I harp on representation at every point that I can because, you know, again, I wish that I had someone who looked like me when I was a little kid and um, was doing astronomy. So that's, I think, really important. I also think that, you know, a lot of kids are, are interested in STEM and they are, the interest is already there. The, the, the challenging part is keeping them in STEM because a lot of the times there are barriers and external factors that make them drop out. And so, you know, staying, incredibly empathetic and compassionate to everybody's different circumstances and, um, you know, teaching with kindness and not, um, you know, other more hostile ways of communicating, I think is really important. There are a lot of times when I was told you don't belong here or, you know, you're not good enough to do this. And um, I think, you know, I was lucky to have my, you know, my parents and, and other people who stood up for me, but not everybody has a community or advocates or mentors who, who can do that. And so I think it's the responsibility of educators and people to be mindfully aware of how they communicate in order to get people, um, you know, to, to remain um, in STEM and feel like they're, they're able to do it. Thank you. I don't think we can harp enough uh, about increasing representation. So um, that's all good. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask our middle grade novelists um, about writing kind of more intense material for, for kids and, and caring for readers in that sort of way. Um, I'll start with Taylor. Um, you're on the, the fantasy side of things, but like you said, there's there's some intensity that goes along with the stories and, and you're in that sort of horror territory. Um, I guess, what, what do you, is there anything that you just love about writing those scary stories, but also um, when you're dealing with middle grade, how do you, like, do you feel like you have to hold it back or temper it down a little bit? Um, or are there, are there ideas you've had that are too much that you, for middle grade that you've maybe reserved for YA or anything like that? <laughs> I feel like if you can get away with like a ghostly mother murdering her <laughs> children and hunting down more children to murder like there's no sky's the limit um no yeah, that's I actually <laughs> usually I usually just write because like I was saying I feel like you know in my culture especially my grandma is like Mexican from Mexico and she just there's so much less coddling <laughs> when it comes to scary stories so I I remember scaring my classmates being like did you guys hear it because and I thought I was like the scaredy cat in my family like among my cousins and stuff I was like don't don't, don't stop it's awful but then you know with other kids that were not from my culture they were like what the hell <laughs> like why <laughs> your grandma told you that story so yeah I usually go for I go for the scariest thing I can think of and then I let someone else tell me <laughs> if it's too scary um and I I do I love writing scary stories for kids because they were so formative to me as a kid and I think it's because Sto scary stories especially in books are like the first time as kids we come up against like really who we are and how we're going to respond in 
in terrifying situations and obviously like hopefully in real life they're not physical monsters but I think it's like a safe kind of sandbox to sort of figure out how you're going to react when you're scared or pressed that are you a kid who's going to like shy away are you going to be like pow and learn everything you possibly can about everything so you can control every scenario which is relatable to me um so yeah I just think like there are a lot of scary things in the world the more intersecting marginalizations you have the scarier the world is so I think it's really so important at an early age to kind of like come up against those safe ways to test yourself and like kind of start to figure out how you're going to respond right on Alda, so you're you're also dealing with difficult kind of intense subject matter, but um, you know, based in realism, obviously. Although it all sort of it's all the same thing at the end of the day. Um, but how did you kind of go about um, handling those and 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 um, making those? I mean, because there's some hard stuff in, in your book. Um, how, how do you make that kind of a, an okay experience, a safe experience for a, a middle grade reader? It, uh, a lot of rewriting, <laughs> I noticed that just because it, the subject it is heavy, it's war. Yeah. And uh, the narratives that I wrote or interviews from that era, it's just a horrible thing. I mean, it's war, you know, ho horrible things happen in war. But trying to mold that for a, ch a child, it, it took a lot of rewriting and also reading the masters, you know, what what had the masters of, of children's literature did, you know, for those topics. So I've read a lot of those books and try to see and guide myself how to best explain things. And um, and also my critique part, my, my husband's a person that who first reads my my stuff. And uh, for one scene that was pretty intense in, in the book, uh, during that time I had been uh, reading a lot of um, Stephen King. So when I wrote that scene, it, it came up, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty bad, uh, pretty gruesome. And I, I remember my husband read it and he said, whoa, you know, this, this is for middle grade. You know, you can't write this for middle grade. And so I took a look again and sure enough, he said, you know, just back away from the Stephen King for a little bit and put your mind channel it into middle grade. And, and yeah, I rewrote the scene and yeah, it was a lot more for that audience. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a balance that you have to, and being a new writer, you know, I had to look to the masters, to the people who had done it before me and who did a great job at, at uh, portraying war scenes to, to children. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Um, Catherine, let me come back to you um, to talk a little bit more about the, the art side of, of, of everything. Um, so you obviously have a history of, of using color really symbolically and really powerfully. Um, and we, we all just got to see your book. And, and I mean, it's incredibly striking how the, just, the, just the use of color alone tells, tells a story. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how you utilize color. Sure. I, um, I've always been sort of fascinated with color. And um, for example, with um, there's all these decisions that I'm constantly making about if I mix the color and what does it mean symbolically. So my background um, for a long time was uh, graphic design. And um, so I'm always kind of thinking about warm colors and cool colors. But for lunch every day, for example, um, I made some other uh, kind of tweaks to it where um, I, I made it so symbolically the boy you never see actually Jim. Um, throughout the book until um, the lady sees him. So it's it was a staging sort of effect, but he's always from the back or from the side or silhouetted or um, just compositionally. Um, I moved it so there's a lot of negative space, but he's kind of an observer. Um, but color played a, a big um, theme here where it gets warmer, where it's sort of in the direction that he wants to go, for example. And um, again, um, I don't, I decided to reveal um, what he looks like when he's finally seen. And Serafina and I mean, Alda and Taylor, we've all talked about, about representation and sort of our own backgrounds, but so much about, it seems like the theme is, is about being seen um, in the world and um, getting that representation out there. So I'm totally with all these ladies here. I, I love what everybody's been saying. <laughs> It's been great. For sure. Um, so sort of as a closer, and this will kind of be a somewhat of a recap sort of question, I guess, for each of you. 
Um, but maybe we can just go down the line um, in order of presentation. So starting with Taylor um, and just kind of say who your ideal reader is and um, what you hope they take away from your book. So yeah, we'll start with Taylor and then we'll go Catherine, Alda, Serafina. Yeah, this is always such an interesting question. I think I wrote the book for the younger version of me, <laughs> which I often do. Um, but I think so the ideal reader to me, the people I wrote it for are kids who are, you know, from the same culture as me and have not had their experiences reflected because my whole goal was to make a story that felt like a fun, you know, Rick Riordan type adventure, but also with kind of like the family and cultural touchstones that were going to make it feel like home. And so, yeah, I hope that I hope that those kids are finding it. But I also have increasingly heard from readers who read it and are not part of that culture and we're like oh I was so interested to learn about this culture and like that has also been really rewarding too because I think it's I think it's so important like I was saying in my presentation the the idea of mirrors and windows like you want to see kids that are not like you being humanized and being living fully as themselves and all their intersections and contrasts and glory and I think that's so incredibly important so I don't, I don't think there's a kid I wouldn't want to read the book. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think just, and as far as what I hope people get out of it, I kind of stopped thinking about it because of course there's a thing I want everyone to get out of it, but I've been so surprised and enlightened by what people have gotten out of it that I never intended that at this point, I just hope people find whatever they need in it. Nice, Catherine. Yeah, I'm with you, Taylor. It's sort of like um, whoever finds the book, um, my ideal reader is any reader, you know, whether it's beginning or an adult or, you know, parent picking it up for their kid. Um, my, my books do deal with um, character building issues and economic disparity. Um, I, um, I think if I was going to focus in on a reader, though, um, you know, maybe even a uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, that age bracket, because we're all kind of entering school at that time. And um, it's really hard to work with the social dynamic and you see somebody picking on somebody else and you don't know what to say or do. And um, it's also um, what Jim taught me is it's easy to label um, or put labels on people um, based on their actions. Um, and of course, over time, our actions do start defining who we are as people. But in the beginning, you know, when we start categorizing and labeling people right away, they start identifying themselves as a bully. And as Jim had said to me, um, you know, his path could have been very, very different um, than how it ended up going. But he had people who didn't label him as such, as, as just a bully. They saw him as, as something more. Um, and even an educator um, like the audience here reached out beyond and um, another teacher um, and invited him to a whole uh, um, leadership conference. And usually that goes to the good kids is what he said, but um, this teacher saw something in him and the other kids at this conference didn't know who he was at all. And he saw himself in a whole different perspective because people treated him without that label. And it was very enlightening, so. Alda, you want to take a shot? <laughs> sure, yeah. No, the I think it's for readers who want to go through an experience or experience that journey that Petra follows, you know, whether you're a child yourself or a grown up, uh, Hispanic culture, non-Hispanic, just so you could merge yourself into that world, into that uh that resilience or people who like hearing stories of uh, resiliency and uh, and also people who like to uh, connect cultures and see what what uh, connects us all because I think all of us as humans we have something that connects us and the book opens up by talking about the way Mexicans view signs and uh, superstitions and I think that's across the world. I think so many cultures have that in common. So that's what I'm hoping to, to get readers who, who view that and who wanna connect or who also wanna 
take a peek into that world in that period of time and realize too that those problems are not unique to Mexicans or to a certain group of people, but are, are problems that affect and many times and all over the world in terms of refugees, like right now happening in Syria or in, in our own uh, back door here in the South. Can you bring us home, Serafina? I'll do my best. <laughs> Everybody did such a wonderful job. Um, yeah, I think, you know, my, my book is, frankly, I think for anyone who is curious about our universe and learning more about our place within it, and that is for any age. Um, obviously, you know, I think the writing is more targeted towards, you know, ages four to eight, but I think that anybody who is curious about exploring and about the cool, exotic, wonderful things that remind us of our own humanity and the sort of grand expanse of the cosmos um, and who, you know, want to see themselves being able to explore. Um, so I hope that, you know, people of any age and any gender and any marginalized or non-marginalized identity will find themselves in these pages and be able to get something um, about the beauty of our universe from them. Thank you. And I'll just, I just, I'll just add how, how cool it was for me to see a, a picture book that kicked off by mentioning dark matter. I was like, where, where was that? I mean, it wasn't really, yeah. that was an idea yet when I was a kid, but um, it really is a, an inspiring sort of creative thing, like Aldo was talking about, um, yes. the, the bridge between nonfiction and fiction and everything. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for this wonderful panel. It was really good. Four really cool books, four great artists. Um, I appreciate it. And I am going to wrap things up here. You can safely turn off your cameras and wave goodbye. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everyone. So tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. You can still register for ALA's virtual annual conference and exhibition. Starting tomorrow, this year's conference will feature amazing speakers, including President Barack Obama, educational programming, and an opportunity to connect with colleagues and librarians everywhere. Visit 2021.alaannual.org for more information. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offered to get Booklist for only $75. And just a note, our June issue is currently free and open to everybody online. Head over to booklistonline.com to start reading. And while you're perusing Booklist online, be sure to check out Book Links, a quarterly supplement to Booklist, perfect for educators and school librarians. It is now freely available to everybody. To start reading, type booklinks.booklistonline.com into your web browser. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you again to our panelists. And one more thank you to our sponsors, Disney Publishing Worldwide, Sourcebooks, Gibbs Smith, and KO Kids. This concludes today's webinar.